appreciate you guys in our world. You're such an encouragement. Awesome. Here we are. We're uh, continuing our series on Love Squared. I think we've got... There we go. Love Squared. This morning, I want to start with a question. Who here knows their neighbor? Anyone know their neighbor? Anyone like their neighbor? Anybody love their neighbor? Questions are getting pretty tricky there, and I think... There's probably a few people that was like stuck on question one. Wait a minute, pastor. Like, do you mean, do I know my neighbor? Do you mean their name? Do you mean like my next door neighbor? Do you mean like neighbor? Like what, what, what are the specifics here? Can you, can you tell me who my neighbor is so I can tell you who my neighbor is? Like, what are you, what are you asking here? Before I put my hand up and make a commitment, I want to know what it is that you're asking. Well, the good news is that the very place in scripture where Jesus is calling us to have love, to love God, and to love others is also the same place where Jesus explains who our neighbor is. So the scripture, it says, love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So we're in good company this morning, and we're, we're actually going to spend a bit of time there in Luke chapter 10. So those with your Bibles, if you can grab them out, get Luke chapter 10 ready. That's where we're going to be spending the majority of our time this morning, is looking through um, and understanding deeper what this means. Now, I just need to position this morning um, as a reminder what the purpose of a Sunday morning message is. Um, Because if you've been to church more than once, you've probably realized that this is you being talked at. There's not too much opportunity for you to, to engage with it and ask questions about it. And this isn't new. This is sort of how messages have been provided all the way through even a lot of the Old Testament and the synagogues and then in the New Testament and the new church. But something that they did really well is they got together and they wrestled the word. And there's, there's a group of people in, in Scripture and they just were famous because of their wrestling of the word, and I want us to be Berean. I want us to be like that group of people who wrestle the word. So, whenever you come to a Sunday service, I want you to have some way of being able to take some notes of either a scripture that is impressed upon your heart or something that God has touched you with that you need to go home and look into a bit more. Maybe something to bring up at your connect group and some questions to ask or a revelation that you got that you can share with the group. Or, you know, questions to talk to your peers or your friends about, or maybe even to contact the church during the week and go, hey, there's there's something about this. I'm either not agreeing with it, or I'm struggling with it, or I've been stuck in this, and I believe God wants to bring some deliverance, and I want to partner with you guys. This is what makes Sundays powerful, is what we do with it. So can I encourage you this Sunday and every Sunday to make space for taking notes of what do I do from here? Whether it's, again, reading the scripture, asking questions, engaging with it, and wrestling with it. Because the power of the word is in its outworking. So we're going to read some fairly famous and well-known scripture this morning, but we're going to position ourselves in a way of going, isn't that fascinating? Even if we've heard it before, we're going to go, okay, God, why are you saying this to me this morning, and what do I need to do with it. Because we're going to be going through the story of the Good Samaritan. Anyone familiar with this story? Great. Awesome. Well, why don't we start and pray first. Heavenly Father, as we've sung about this morning, about your love, make us really aware. Thank you for how loved I am by you. God, would you Impress upon me and allow me to feel a a larger measure of your love this morning. God, would you, in response to your love towards me, invite me to love you in a great way this morning? Lord, would you invite me and expand me in my ability to love you? Lord, would you lead me to love others? And this morning, as we open your word... Would you open it to us, bring us revelation, open our eyes to see, open our hearts to receive, and lead our hands to act in a way according to your love. As you were moved by compassion, move us 
by compassion. We pray today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Cool. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all of the scripture and then I'm going to work backwards through it so that we can really dig deep into what is being said. So Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Uh, You can read along here or you can read along in your Bibles. If you're reading from the New King James Version, it should sound just like this. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus saying, teacher, What should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answered, What is written in the law and what is your reading of it? And the lawyer answered Jesus and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus responded to the lawyer and said, you've answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus answered and said, and this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. You may be familiar with it. Ready? A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell amongst thieves who stripped him of his clothing They wounded him, and they departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, he came and looked, but also passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where this wounded man was. And when the Samaritan saw him, he had compassion. And the Samaritan went to the wounded man. He bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine, and set this man on his own animal and brought him into an inn. There he took care of him. Then the next day... When the Samaritan departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of this man, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three, of the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, do you think was the neighbor to the one who fell amongst the thieves? And the lawyer said to Jesus, he who showed mercy. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. (laughs) Straight up, I see Jesus flip the whole concept on its head. We see at the beginning there, the lawyer First of all, he was trying to test Jesus. He was trying to trap Jesus. Then he was trying to impress Jesus or justify himself, prove his own position. His motivation in this wasn't a motivation of love. And he was asking the question, who qualifies to be worthy of my love? Who is my neighbor? On whom do I allow my awesomeness to exist? Who do I share my incredible charisma, my excellence of wisdom, my manly physique? Who do I share me with? Who is my neighbor? And he's asking a question, again, about who qualifies. (laughs) But Jesus flips it on its head immediately. And instead of the question being who qualifies to be worthy of my love and of my generosity, Jesus says, we need to be neighborly. We need to qualify to give love. And it's not about on whom We give the love to, but on who we choose to be. The lawyer's positioning was about 
here I am. Now, who do they need to be to earn my love? And Jesus said, no. It comes back, the impetus comes back to the individual on who are you? Who are you going to choose to be? Who are you going to grow to be? How are you going to love? It's this great challenge immediately into, the, into what this, this lawyer was trying to do. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. He's not talking about who earns our love, but how we give our love. How we qualify to be someone who gives love. It's, it's incredible. It's, it's not who they are or how they are, but who we are and how we love that matters the most. Now, the big theme in this, this one here is this word. This word of mercy. Now, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, the lawyer couldn't even bring himself to say Samaritan. There was only three options here. He could have said, not the Levite, not the priest. He could have said the Samaritan, but no, because of his own piousness and prejudice and his own arrogance and selfishness, he wasn't even able to bring himself to say Samaritan. We're going to find out a little bit more why later. But he said, the one who showed mercy. And it's actually for our benefit that he does this as well, because mercy is such a powerful word that I think we miss. Again, this is an English problem. Now, the word for mercy in Greek, which is where it was written, so when, when this scripture was originally written, it was, would have been written in Greek, elios, 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 E-L-E-O-S, um, yeah, elios. It's, when we use that elios, that term of mercy, it, it's used to describe a person who who shows kindness towards a miserable or an afflicted person. Now, Bell, during communion just before, was talking about, about people that were in a miserable state. They, they were in a completely incapacitated state. They were in a very challenging and a hard state. They were afflicted and they were miserable. So... Elias is a person who shows kindness towards a miserable or afflicted person. And there's two sides. It could be done out of pity or it could be done out of compassion. So that's the Greek word, okay? Now, first of all, how was our hero, the Good Samaritan, what was he motivated by? Was it pity or compassion? When he saw him, he had compassion. And so out of compassion, our hero, Mr. Samaritan, he showed kindness towards someone who was miserable and afflicted. That fits. But mercy is even bigger than that because I believe that mercy is a more Hebrew term because it is so such a powerful word to explain part of the person of God, the characteristics of God. And so when mercy is used, there's actually three Hebrew words that are used to explain mercy. And so I've taken this little, let me get back to it. Here we go. I've taken this little snippet so that, that we're able to explore these three concepts of a Hebrew word of mercy a little bit deeper. So biblical mercy is a broader and deeper term than just simply forgiveness, which may be how you were thinking of mercy before. So the English mercy actually translates several Hebrew words. So as you're reading in your scripture and you see mercy, it could be one of these three words in the Old Testament. First, the verb hanan asserts mercy as God's gracious gift. So if we're looking at that one, it's probably a little bit more like the first term in the Greek that we were looking at before, less on the compassion side and more on the... Pity side. And, and so the people that came to Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on me. 
Again, that was Greek because it's New Testament, but in Hebrew, likely it would have been this Hanan. Lord, give me a gracious gift. Pity me. I need something that I'm not so deserving of, okay? The next one, this is wild. This blew me away. This is a fresh revelation for me. The verb, the, the Hebrew word for mercy, rehamim, is the plural of womb. Anyone here think of mercy and think of womb straight away? Okay, I can keep pretending I'm smart then. I'm amongst good company. It, the concept, it connects mercy, this is phenomenal, to womb emotion. You've got to understand that a, a Jewish person is, is a deeply a gut person. I'm not talking about being run by emotions, but being led. They're a very spiritual person. They, they run on their gut feel very, very much. When they talk about the heart and the stomach, there's, there's a whole bunch of of psychology that we can really miss here in the West and what they're talking about. But even beyond that, when they're talking about womb emotion, it's, it's like a womb emotion that a mother has for a child. Now, I only have limited experience in childbirthing, like the painful side where my poor hand is being squeezed. <laughs> but it's amazing... That in my experience, at least, and in other guys that I've shared my story with, that the woman never, I've never heard once, maybe this, this has happened, but it's, it's chemically that the mother doesn't blame the child for the pain that just happened. They blame the husband. 100%. There is this incredible compassion. There is this mercy. There is this rehemim that happens. And this mother doesn't even have the choice. They have this mercy towards this lump. And it's this amazing concept that I have so missed when I think about the mercy of God, is that he's literally got me in his womb as his child that is directed in that mercy towards me, that it's unchoosable. My, I'm just like, whoa. This whole mercy thing is so much bigger. And the last one, chesed. Say it with me, chesed. More phlegm, please. Chesed. Thank you. Much better. Chesed. Chesed. Now, if you're reading the New Testament, when, when it talks about mercy, this is often the term it's talking about. Chesed. Now, I didn't realize that it was mercy because this term is the one that's used about God's covenantal promises. It's like a marriage contract. When a, when a man and a woman make a marriage contract before God, it's a commitment beyond feelings. And emotions. It's a choice to continue and to grow. The in sickness or in health and the good times and bad. It's like you say it really easily on the day. But the marriage is different from the wedding. And we're committing to this long-term thing. And we understand that the mercy of God exists within this chesed. Covenantal promise and commitment for him to show mercy towards us, unmerited favor deep in his bosom with gracious gifts that continually pour out. When we understand mercy in its context, because mercy is written about God so much, we understand the character of God, we understand mercy, then we understand what the Samaritan showed towards this man who had been beaten up and then we can understand that Jesus says, go and do likewise. How do we do mercy? Well, I didn't even really understand mercy before now, clearly. I thought mercy is what you say when you're in a wrestling match and someone pins you and you're like, mercy, I'm tapping out. But this is something that is just incredible and beautiful that happens here. Go and do likewise. Man. Go and do mercy. Well, what does mercy look like 
for a Samaritan man. Mercy looks like this. Remember, three people walked past. The first saw and walked on the other side. The second saw and looked, went closer and looked. But the third really saw. The first thing that mercy does is mercy sees. Mercy sees in the way that God wants us to see. It was the same man who was wounded by the side of the road, but only one of them saw him. Have you ever had that experience? You've gone into a room of people, and either no one's seen you, or one person has seen you, and it contrasts to everything else that happens. Have you ever been seen? This Samaritan man saw him. So the first thing mercy does is mercy sees. The second thing mercy does, it is moved by pity. No. Second thing mercy does is it's moved by compassion. It could be moved by pity, but that will only get you so far. If you want to love as God loves, you need to be moved by compassion. The next thing the Samaritan did was he bandaged and cleaned his wounds. He treated them with oil and wine. That's like some gritty stuff. Like hard enough just to put a covering over the top of something. But he got in and he cleansed. He knelt down with this man. He cleansed out his wounds. He put him on his own animal. That means he had to walk. He brought him to an inn. We don't even know if that was the way that the Samaritan man was going. He took him to the inn. He cared for him. And then he put him in the care of someone else who would be able to adequately and properly care for him. He paid the price. There was no cost to the man who was receiving the mercy, the Samaritan made sure it was all expenses paid beyond that. He wasn't just committed to the, the present, but he made a promise and a commitment to the ongoing recovery of the man that was wounded. Anyone else realizing their mercy runs a bit short? I'm just like, wow, this, this, is, this is incredible. This is, this is amazing. Man, God, open my, open my eyes. And so there's a few things that stand out to me by this point about being neighborly. Being neighborly sounds costly. It sounds really inconvenient. And it sounds really awkward. Now, maybe you don't understand how this was so awkward, but Jesus was very intentional about choosing a Samaritan man to be the hero of this story. Because when you understand the context of who Jesus was speaking to, which was predominantly a Jewish crowd, and the man whom he was addressing, which this says a lawyer, and if you, if you look in original text, it says an expert of Torah, which Torah is the law. And so, but, but with us saying lawyer, we can maybe miss what was actually happening here. So in the Old Testament, in the Torah, in the law, there are 616 laws that a Jewish person was to follow. And so what a lawmaker or an expert in law would actually do is they would sit in these laws and they would make up more laws to make it easier to follow the other ones. So there's literally thousands of laws that you'd need to follow. And so understand when Jesus is choosing very intentionally all of the components of this story, he chooses a priest, he chooses a Levite, and he chooses a Samaritan as the key characters. This is utterly offensive to any pious Jew, let alone one who is deeply steeped into the law of God. And here's why. A Samaritan was a person who was from the town of Samaria, otherwise known as Shomron in the original. Now, Shomron was a city 
from Israel. Now, we've got to understand it this way. So originally, um, the Israeli people were 12 tribes. They were one nation. But what happened after a few kings is a bunch of them split off and said, we're not following this king anymore. We're going this way. And the others stayed behind. They stayed behind. They had the temple. That was Judah. They had the temple and the throne was still set up there. But the king departed over this way and they went, we're going over here. Now, over time, the king realized, the king of Israel with all of these, um, the tribes that were with him realized, oh, every time that there is a sacrifice to be made back in the temple, they're sitting underneath that king. We're going to lose some of our people. Now, you couldn't write this story. So what they did is they made their own gods. And you're never going to guess what the gods were that they made. Golden cows. Like you think, you've been there. Look how that turned out. The Exodus, hello. But they, they do it. They create these golden cows. They set up their own temples and altars and sacrifice. Even to the point they set up guards around the borders to make sure their people didn't go and sacrifice in Jerusalem in the temple. That was the first sort of frustration between Shomron and, and someone who was worshipping Yahweh, the one true God. But it continued on. There was wicked and evil kings that continued to rule and reign in Israel. And they continued to fall further and further away from God to the point where eventually the Assyrian army came and wiped out the whole lot of that place. And what happens when the Assyrians conquered a place, to make it easier, they would dispel all the people that lived there and they'd have to go and live in other conquered cities. So they'd be in some vassal state somewhere within the, the newly conquered Assyrian empire. And a whole bunch of pagans came and occupied Shomron. Then over time, a couple of Israelis would, would trickle back in and then they would intermarry with those that were, were living there and they'd take on their gods and, and their sort of thing. Over time, Judah, the other, the other tribes that had the God worship and had a bunch of good kings, unfortunately, they still had a bunch of really rubbish kings. And they pursued other gods and didn't love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And eventually, they were conquered by the Babylonians, and they were displaced as well. And so a whole bunch of displaced Israelis, instead of being separated now, they're just a whole bunch of separated people all throughout all the kingdoms. But something happened is people began to call on the name of God again, and they began to ask forgiveness. And they asked for, for God to restore them, and we see them return back to their land, and God starts to bless them. But what happens is there's a group of people already occupying there who are into polygamy, or, or like that's actually the marriage side of it, but they're, they're, that's their religious. Instead of having a monotheistic, one God worldview, they have a polytheistic worldview, and they incorporate God into many gods. And it just isn't compatible with a worshiper of Yahweh, the one true God who has no others beside him. And so there was this deep tension that went on for generations between those from Shomron and the, and, and the, the Jewish people, those that remained true to God. And, but we see that Unfortunately, the, these Jewish people, and we see this so much like ourselves, is, is often the Jewish people thought of themselves as the, as the upper echelon. We're so much better than everyone else. We're God's called people. They were called to be a seed and a light into all the world to show all the world God's goodness and love. But they just said, we're it, and you're all rubbish. And often as Christians, we can do the same thing. We can look down on other people and go, you're a filthy, dirty, rotten sinner. But I've got all of the answers instead of being loving and then drawing people. Anyway, so, so this, is, this is what the, the challenge was. But even above any people group, the Jewish people had this special place of hatred for Samaritans, for those from Shomron. And so when Jesus is telling this story, he's actually employing something that he does often in, in his narrative storytelling is, is, a, is a theme of comparison. You can see this throughout many of Jesus' teachings. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like, or uh, the sheep are on one side and the goats are on one side, or you, you brood of serpents. He's, he's using this comparison thing very often. And we see here he's comparing a priest and a Levite. So a priest is someone, obviously, who serves in the temple. And a Levite is like their assistant or a worship leader, let's just say, okay? And then a Samaritan. We can see there's this, there's this great big divide between 
what this is. And so in the mind of the audience, and in particular the lawyer, they're thinking, Jews good, Samaritans bad. And we notice even at the end, he can't even bring himself to say the Samaritan when Jesus asked, who was a neighbor? Notice he didn't say, who are my neighbors? But he said, who was a neighbor? He flipped that question around really powerfully, right? And, and so this, this lawyer is, is challenged right to the pit of him. So now you understand why it was a little bit awkward for the Samaritan to be showing mercy and love. This is someone who deeply hated who he was at his core. And he, he literally served in such a beautiful and a powerful way. All right, so we've got the priest, uh, the priest and the Levite, one of them. He didn't even take a closer look. The second one at least started to look a little bit more. And generally what we find in our journey with, with Christ is he invites us into an act of mercy. And sometimes we might act like person number one. Sometimes we might act like person number two. You know those times where God's like, pay for that person's groceries? And you're like, oh, yeah. Mm. And you, you at least hear it. You don't completely ignore it. So the first one's where you just don't hear God say anything at all. The second one's where you hear it and you're like, maybe next time. And the third one's where you actually go and do what you're led to do by the Spirit, right? So these are the three different types of experience we can have when God is calling us to show mercy. And it's showing here that the priest and the Levite were likely the kin. They were the same people group, Jewish people. But they didn't show mercy. They weren't the neighbor. Okay, this is a challenge to us in our thinking about who our neighbor could be. But this part here, I love, I love this. These two bits of scriptures here, we can say, first of all, he's trying to test Jesus, and he was trying to justify himself before Jesus. And this is really the epitome. This is really the, the whole context of what we're looking at, is that when mercy is driven out of self and selfishness, we're not able to show mercy. And writing this, I'm, I'm looking at myself, and even in my giving of love at often times, it's selfish. Maybe I'm not alone. That we, we, we do something out of love, but there's still some selfish reasons connected. But what Jesus is wanting to try and do, and what he actually does, is he helps to, to bring this back to a base. And, but, but what I love what Jesus does here is he actually meets the lawyer where he's at. And this is what Jesus does to each and every one of us. You may have noticed a couple of weeks within the last month, we've had um, someone speak about how Peter and Jesus, and Jesus says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And so in the original, it's like, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter's like, yes, Lord, I phileo you. And so they're different forms. Peter, do you agape me? Yes, Lord, I phileo you. And then the last time, Peter, do you phileo me? Yes, Lord, I phileo you. And so Jesus will always come and meet us where we're at, but he'll call us to something bigger that he wants us to go to. This is what he does with the lawyer. So when Jesus is answering the question of the lawyer, he speaks to him based on where he is. Now, a lawyer is someone that understands the law. They understand the rules. And so Jesus asks him, and he says... What is written in the law, and what is your reading of it? This is the beauty of us as Christians, is that God will always take us from where we are and call us to something bigger. God met the lawyer, even though the lawyer was trying to justify himself, even though the lawyer was trying to trap, trap Jesus, Jesus, always motivated by compassion, was still trying to step him up to another level was giving him and inviting him in to a deeper revelation and realization of who that lawyer was called to be according to who Jesus was, the savior of the whole world. This is powerful. And you can probably see this in your own world is that Jesus will always meet you where you are and call you into something bigger. And what my hope and prayer is that for you today is that you will see where you are and not be, not be condemned by it. But see the opportunity of Christ calling you up. He will always meet you where you are. Oh, it's so, it's so, so powerful. Anyway, practically now. Let's, let's, let's get practical on all of this. Let me get to... Here. Cool. All right. Practically. Heavenly Father. 
We need your Holy Spirit. Because if we could do this, we already would be doing this. Our community would look so totally different. And I get the impression, my God, that you're wanting to call us into a higher love. That you're wanting to call us, and when we're called to love you, that there's, there's more. There's more. So Lord, would you show us who to love and how to love them in Jesus' name? Simply praying that prayer is dangerous. It will change your life. I should have done that disclaimer before you might have said amen with me, shouldn't I? Got you now. (laughs) But there's someone that actually prayed a prayer very, very similar. And we were talking about the kings of Israel before. So there was three kings that had the united Israel. The third one was King Solomon. And he made a thousand sacrifices before God. And that night in sleep, God met him and said, ask whatever you want. And here is what Solomon answered. Now, often again, this is the limited limitations of English. Often we'll say wisdom. But what Solomon actually specifically asked for was a discerning heart. A wise and discerning heart. And here's what that means. It means an understanding mind and a hearing heart to be able to judge. Remember, he was king. So in order to bring about justice. Now, here's the powerful thing is that Solomon knew who his neighbors were. He had millions of those that he was called to serve. Now, as king, he didn't elevate himself above them, but when God offered to give him whatever he asked, he asked to expand and increase in his ability to be able to serve. Like, this is huge, right? So that prayer that we just prayed, it's an expansive prayer. Prayer, because I think some of us haven't been giving our mercy to all of our ability, to all of our capability. I think we've been underestimating our ability to mercy. But if we have a heart like Solomon in his early days, not his later days, I won't cover that today, but early Solomon is good, right? This prayer that he prayed of God, give me an understanding mind and a hearing heart to be able to bring justice. He increased his resource. His ability to neighbor expanded, and he neighbored to his potential. Are you neighboring to your potential? What's your sphere of influence? Who are you called to neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Maybe it's your school. Maybe it's your workplace. Maybe it's a platform. Okay? So here's the thing, and this is how I just want to wind it all up. I'll do it. James, the brother of Jesus. He got, he got a concept of something, and this brings it into how we can practically outwork this, okay? So this wisdom does not descend from above. What type of wisdom? It's the wisdom that is envious and self-seeking, okay? All right, let's read it. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it's earthly, it's sensual, and it's demonic. It's based on our emotive feeling and our, our need to just to respond to what I want right now. Like a whole bunch and a bag of M&Ms right now. That's, that's the sensual, okay? Because wherever there's envy and self-seeking, wherever those things exist, and again, being honest, and oftentimes even in my best ability to do something really awesome, there's, it's really hard for me to cut out en- envy. If there's, a, if there's another pastor who I really love and love their ministry and what they're doing and God's doing amazing things, I've got to admit, when I'm celebrating them, there's a little bit of envy in me going, why aren't I able to produce that? But wherever any of that exists, there's confusion and evil things there. Oh, that makes sense. But wisdom, hey, wisdom. Ah, so when we talk about wisdom that Solomon asked for, now that we've got that expanded version of wisdom, a discerning heart and ability to bring justice, that wisdom that comes from above, first of all, it is fully pure. There is no immoral motive in it. Lord, please, double helping. I need that. I don't do that on my own. But it's, it's peaceable. It's gentle and it's willing to yield. We see that in Solomon. As king, he could have super- usurped. He could have, he could have forced his position on people, but he used it to yield and to serve and to bring justice to the people. He was full of, he was full of, hallelujah, and good fruits 
Go and do likewise. The fruits is what you produce. It's the outcome. And this happens without partiality and without hypocrisy. Because the fruit of righteousness, the outcome of righteousness, what we produce from being righteous, that's sown in peace by those who make peace. The Samaritan made a choice to operate in peace in an, in an environment of war. There was combat between them. Maybe you experience combat in your family. Maybe you experience combat in your workplace. Maybe you experience combat in your emotions. Maybe you experience combat with yourself. Maybe you're experiencing combat against God. But those who make peace, God wants you to make peace with yourself, make peace in that situation, and to operate even when there's challenge. The next part of there, it talks about hypocrisy and partiality. They're actually the same word. A hypocrite was a stage actor who wore many masks. That's where that term comes from. It was someone who was different in different parts. So God is calling us to be impartial. And without hypocrisy, to be pure and peaceable and gentle. We don't do this on our own. It only comes from getting the wisdom from God. The wisdom we have in the world, it comes from around us. That's the stuff we start with. And this is why we seem to be getting ourselves into a little bit of trouble. And so I just love the way that, that James is able to, to, to bring this, to going from from envy and self-seeking to wanting to catch people out and to expose them as a fraud, like the lawyer was trying to do, to trying to puff themselves up and to justify themselves and to make themselves look good in front of other people. Guilty as charged. Sounds like I'm alone. All right, well, you guys can pray for me at the end. But there's four things that I see as we, uh, as we just wrap this up this morning. There's four things, just to encourage you to love neighborly. There's four things that I see that really neighboring well and loving well with mercy, that these are how, practically, how we have to love. We have to love resourcefully. It's going to cost you. The Samaritan, it cost him quite a lot. He was committed to future cost. But also, we, we see in the story of the Samaritan that he had bandages ready. He was ready to be able to serve in mercy. And King Solomon, he was resourceful and he prayed that God would increase and expand his resource to be able to offer more mercy to those who were his neighbors. Powerful, right? You've got to do it resourcefully. Next, we've got to do it inconveniently. Who wants some of that? Yes, please, give me two serves of that. Loving inconveniently. You know, everyone was on their way to somewhere. The priest was on his way, likely to the temple. The Levite was on his way. And I think maybe one of, part of the reason that they passed by is they didn't want to be ceremonially unclean. What I mean by that is on their way to do service, they missed doing service. Man, I'm preaching to myself this morning. So busy doing the things that I think God wants me to do that I'm missing the people God wants me to serve. And loving people, loving your neighbor as yourself, it's going to be seriously inconvenient because the present interrupts you. Often we can read, and on his way, a woman reaches out and touches Jesus. And on his way, a crowd of people gather about. Jesus is like, let's get out of here. And then a crowd of people. And Jesus is moved by compassion. He was on his way to doing his mission. It was seriously inconvenient for Jesus to die on a cross. It was seriously inconvenient for him to be hatched up with a bunch of bozos that kept missing the point. It's really awkward. Really awkward. But you know what? You need to embrace the awkward. Your irks and quirks... Okay, don't force your irks and quirks onto other people. That's not love and that's not neighborly. 
But it can be really scary to love other people because you're like, I open myself up a little bit when I love people and I'm, I've been hurt. I get a little bit vulnerable and I've got some really weird irks and quirks. <laughs> but the Samaritan literally embraced the man to be able to treat him. He embraced awkward, literally. And you know what? It was super awkward for Jesus to be naked on a cross, beaten and bruised when he had every ability to not do that. We have every ability to not love and to not be merciful. But God invites us to embrace the awkward. And the last thing I want to leave you with this morning is wisdom. We need to love people wisely. First of all, when Solomon asked for wisdom, he asked for expansion. I believe that's something we need to ask for. God, expand my ability to be merciful. But also we need to love wisely. We need to neighbor wisely. A surf lifeguard, if they're coming out to, to save you, they, they don't swim directly to you because... You could drown them. And so you've got to actually put boundaries in because to help people, you need to be safe. Okay, so when we neighbor people and we do it with the, with the best heart of God, we've also got to have wisdom in how we pour that out. We don't encourage and endorse dysfunction. So that means that you don't give a, a, a druggie just cash because you're actually in a in the best of your intentions, probably promoting dysfunction. But don't let that stop you from going and buying them a meal, even though they probably could have afforded if they didn't have the drugs. And we, we got to love wisely. And what I notice about these four things is this is exactly how God loved me. He loved me with the greatest resource of heaven. He poured out Jesus Christ for me. And it cost a great price. He loved me really inconveniently. We kept walking away from God and he kept breaking through and he kept sending messengers and prophets. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, that who would ever believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He loved us super awkwardly. He sent his only son. But he loves us so wisely that God has a plan from beginning to end. And that love is, man. And you know what? I, I can't do this stuff unless I receive God's love in its full measure. So why don't we stand right now? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, good on your will. I thought neighboring was really hard already. Now you've just given me all these really, really hard ways to do it. But here's the invitation. This is how God loves. And he gives us the ability to love that way. <sighs> it, this isn't an inconvenience. Well, it is. But it's an opportunity, an invitation to be as God is. Because this is who he is. His very nature is love. And everything he is is love. And everything he pours out to you is love. And everything he wants for you is love. And he wants you to be moved by love. He wants you to be moved by compassion. And he wants you to show the world compassion. We do that in mercy. And we do this the way that God loves us. And I'm like, wow, God, I see it today. I see it, God. I see your resourceful love towards me. God, I see your inconvenient, overwhelming love. Remember that song? God, your awkward love and your, your, your wise love. So today, Lord, I actually do pray. Don't let my eyes be on the too little, but rise me up. But also, Lord, I don't want to just be on a journey to do something and miss what you have for me in the here and now. So God, give me eyes to see all of the little in-betweens and the presence that you call me to serve into and to bring your mercy into this world and lift my eyes to see that the harvest is ready and you have called me to be a king and a priest and a son of the most high God and to hold influence and to drag those suffering and miserable conditions into the life and light of Jesus Christ. Lord, move me to live and lead in compassion. Hallelujah. And Lord, today, for every person who is struggling to feel your love, break 
the lies, break the deception, break any plan of the enemy that he has with he has sought to withheld the love of God. God, break through this morning. God, send your mercy this morning to come and rescue us. God, overwhelm us in a in its greatest sense and understanding and a life of your love today in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That person that Bell was talking about during communion this morning, the one that doesn't want to just have you stirred by a word and go away and not receive something, but the one that wants you to be stirred to action, the one that wants you to be stirred and to receive your miracle. Church, would you receive your miracle today? Would you receive your miracle of love? Would you receive your miracle of healing? Your miracle of breakthrough? Because you know what? The world needs it, and so do you. So does your family. Your family needs you to love unselfishly. My family really needs me to love unselfishly. I thank you, God, for your power, your power, your power today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today is the day of salvation. Today, God is transforming hearts and lives, and he's opening your eyes to see who he is so that you can see others the way he wants you to. Be motivated, motivated by love. We're going to sing this morning.